morning. Good to see you guys. Good to be here. Faith Bridge, thanks so much for coming this morning. Those of you who join us uh, by live stream, good to have you as well. Thanks so much for joining our Faith Bridge family. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. The uh, very last uh, Sunday of 2019. This is, as you know, kind of the close of the Advent season. And, and uh, most of you probably know that Advent uh, means uh, coming. It's a, it's a season of waiting. Uh, it's a little bit ironic, actually, that, that, that one of the stories that got passed around the most in my home this past Christmas was a, a story that highlighted uh, my distaste, my inability to wait well. Um, is, is, uh, the story uh, is remembered by my wife and daughters, and, and they tend to remember these kind of stories very well. Uh, I, uh, it happened when my wife decided that it would be really cool for us to have a special fondue dinner on Christmas Eve night. So she bought uh, a fondue set, and, and most of you probably know the, the warmth and the romance of, of, you know, sitting there with your little sterno fire underneath this, uh, this pot as you slowly uh, cook your meal and, and maybe have some kind of special dessert and all the while enjoying, uh, you know, leisurely conversation uh, around the table. Well, uh, you know, it sounded like a pretty good idea. My daughters just thought this is going to be amazing. They were just little girls at the time and they thought what a, what a cool thing to have this, you know, pot and a little burner right there on the table, kind of a nice uh, change from the normal mealtime uh, stuff. And, and of course, as a male, I'm going, yeah, everything goes better with an open flame. And, uh, and, and so uh, we, we, we kind of did it. And, and, and actually, at first, I thought it was going to be okay. But, uh, but it wasn't long before uh, the romance part of the dinner began to diminish and the warmth part began to uh, kind of increase. Uh, because what was happening was uh, I just began to realize how long it was taking for me to cook my little pieces of meat. Uh, you know, I have this little thing on a skewer and that little burner's not very hot and I got kind of impatient. Uh, it was a long time between bites. And so uh, if my first instinct uh, reasonably was I just said, okay, I'll, I'll turn, up the, turn up the heat a little bit. Uh, but that wasn't enough. That didn't really seem to make any difference. And so then I uh, actually went into the kitchen and just grabbed all the remaining skewers uh, and, and sort of used them. That way I could have several cooking while I was eating the others. And uh, that seemed to be working pretty well, except my oldest daughter started to complain. She thought it was a little selfish for me to have nine skewers in the pot when each of my family members only had one. In fact, that was kind of sad because uh, the next morning on Christmas Day, Santa didn't visit her. But anyway, I, uh, I thought, okay, all right. And uh, that, still, that was still a little bit irritating. And so I came up with a great idea. I said, look, let's just, let's just forget the little sterno deal. There's nothing romantic about that. So I went and got a hot plate and set that on the table there, and that thing was awesome. I mean, we were cooking our meat in no time. The only problem was uh, my girls were afraid to put their hands near the pot uh, because now uh, hot oil was splashing around the table. And, uh, and I remember kind of, you know, laughing about it and saying, it's not a big deal, and you know, we're making a memory, and, you know, the scarring won't last. And, and, uh, and, and anyway, uh, it, it finally got to a point where essentially... Uh, things got a little bit ugly because the, the uh, pot got so hot that the oil boiled out onto the burner, and that set the tablecloth on fire, <laughs> which was, I still say to this day, was not that big a deal. Uh, in fact, I think I had the fire under control in about two minutes, and, and I remember the girls uh, by bedtime had, had stopped the hysterical screaming. Uh, and, uh, and, and in fact, uh, the, the good news was uh, that we did find out that night that our fire alarm does indeed work. And uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was kind of a disaster in, in terms of me and waiting. But one of the lessons you learn about Advent is that we have to wait. It's the beauty and the importance and the wonder of waiting. In fact, uh, what we see in Scripture, what we often learn through experience is the only way to sustain the joy in this expectancy of the, of the advent beyond just a, a, a few uh, happy weeks a year is to learn the discipline of waiting for God, to recognize that an amazing advent story is 
unfolding, long after the lights have been put away, long after the decorations are down, the trees thrown out or whatever, long after you go back to school, go back to work, there is still an Advent joy that can be sustained. But that Advent story doesn't always look the way we think it will look. It's not always going to look the way we want it to. So this morning, what I'd like us to do is to, on the threshold of this new year, uh, I want us to think together about waiting on God, waiting on God. So if you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to Psalm chapter 13. Psalm chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, these uh, folks coming down the aisle, if you'll just raise your hand, they'd be more than happy to uh, give you one. And uh, you may keep that if you'd like as a gift from your friends here at Faith Bridge, or you could just, at the end of the service, return it to the rack. But uh, keep your hand up and make sure you have a Bible. When you get that Bible, open it up to the very middle. That's going to put you in the book of Psalms. And then uh, flip over to the left to Psalm chapter 13. Psalm chapter 13. Uh, let me just say, uh, by way of introduction, Psalm 13 is a psalm of lament. A psalm of lament. That means it's a pain. Uh, it, it's a pain psalm. It's a psalm of, of sorrow. It's a psalm of complaint. Uh, for those of you who need to know, uh, this psalm is a four on the Enneagram. Uh, it is basically a, a, a psalm uh, that uh, is a psalm of, of mourning in some way. Now, psalms of lament are not always sad, but they are always psalms of, of, of deep, uh, poignant emotion. And you see that displayed in full color right here in Psalm 13. So let's, let's read this passage together. <clears throat> to the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, um, if you look in your Bibles right at the heading, at the very, very beginning of that psalm, you'll notice right off the bat that this is a psalm written by David. And if you know anything about David, you probably know that he's described in the book of Acts as a person of whom God says, this is a man after my own heart, which is pretty sweet, right? I mean, it's just got to look good on your resume. This is God kind of liking you on Facebook. Uh, this, this, this is kind of awesome. But if you know much about David's story, you also know that David was a man of intense passions, uh, who had bitter enemies and who sometimes uh, made very bad choices that led him down roads that were uh, dark and, and rocky and destructive and ultimately uh, heartbreaking. In fact, this is a guy who, who lived to see his own son, Absalom, uh, die as a part of an attempted rebellion against David's own throne. And we don't know really for sure which of these troubles uh, David's referring to here in Psalm chapter 13, but that's in probably some way just, just the point, that, that David's feeling the squeeze from all sides. I mean, you look at the text, verse 1, he feels like God has forgotten him. Then verse 2, he's wrestling kind of internally with the grief and the regret of a, and fear of a man who, who's made a lot of bad decisions that he wishes he could unmake. And, and frankly, those decisions have cost him his son, his throne, and uh, his, his good name. And in meanwhile, it's all that's not bad enough. In verses 3 and 4, we see he's surrounded by enemies, foreign and domestic, who sort of wait like a wild animal to pounce on him at any time moment. So it's a very, very difficult situation. It's not surprising that we kind of hear in these words raw exasperation when David uh, opens his psalm with the very same questions repeated four times. How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? How long, how long? It's as if he's trapped uh, on, on, on four sides by walls of waiting and wrestling and wondering how long, O Lord, Will you hide your face from me? 
And I don't want to move too quickly, uh, frankly, past this question this morning because it's, a, it's an important question to consider, especially on the boundary line between an old year and a, a, a new year. Because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that it's a question some of us in this room this morning know pretty well. We know that question, how long, O oh Lord, ever, ever since the breakup, uh, ever since the the pink slip, ever since uh, you got cut from the team, ever since the diagnosis, ever since the, the miscarriage, ever since your parent died, ever since the, the hurricane, ever since you buried your child. Some of us here this morning have lived in that dark, cramped room of waiting and wrestling where the one question just keeps kind of bouncing off the walls is how long? Oh, Lord, are you going to are you going to hide your face from me? And it's not that we don't believe an amazing story is unfolding. And maybe you've been here these last two weeks here at Faith Bridge when Pastor Adam and Pastor Dan kind of rehearsed for us this amazing story of Jesus from start to finish, from, from Genesis to Revelation. But sometimes the story, it doesn't feel very amazing, does it? Uh, you look back over the last year of your life or, or maybe over the year ahead, and you're not sure, frankly, if the story is unfolding or if it's just maybe coming apart. And I'll be honest, uh, you look at this text this morning, Psalm 13 isn't going to offer us any easy answers. But what it does give us, I think, is a very clear picture of a guy facing real-life struggles with real-life questions and learning how to wait in real life faith. As we look at this passage this morning, we're gonna see uh, from David's experience that authentic faithfulness, authentic faithfulness boils down to three simple words. Three really important words as we stand here on the threshold of a new year and those words are wait, watch, and wonder. Wait, watch, and wonder. Let's, let's begin uh, with faithful waiting. Um, how many of you here, uh, let, let's see a show. How many of you here have ever found yourself in a situation where you called uh, some service center or, or tech support or uh, a police 911 number and, uh, and, and you found yourself listening to some very, very polite machine uh, explain to you, holy cow, we have a whole lot of people calling tonight, uh, but you're very important to us, and, and so we're going to get to your call in just a minute. Please hold, and, uh, and we will get to you. Have you ever heard one of those messages before? Okay, yeah. All right, I mean, I'll tell you what, let's just do this. Right. Put your hand up again if you've, if you've been on hold for at least five minutes. Like you've, you've been, you've, okay. How about, all right, 10 minutes? 10, okay. If you, how about, how about anybody 20 minutes? Really? Anybody longer than, anybody longer than, have, anybody have a personal best longer than 30 minutes? Let's see. You, do, you, you, have, you waited on a whole long, who were you calling that day? I don't even remember. He said he was calling Faith Bridge Church. Uh, no, no uh, he, don't, he said he does not remember. Well, that's very polite, that's very kind, very Christian. I don't think it's gonna encourage you any. But there was a story back in August 2012 carried by ABC News uh, about uh, this guy. His name was Andrew Kahn, and he may have set the world record uh, for the longest hold time. Supposedly, he called Qantas Airways about a flight that he was going to take from Adelaide, Australia to New York City. And uh, that's when he was put on hold and told by a representative uh, that, uh, told by a machine that the representative would be with him, you know, just, just as soon as possible. By the time he'd been on hold uh, for about three hours, he was starting to get curious. Just, just I, I wonder how long they really will make me hold. And so he settled in for the long haul. He said he watched a little TV. He said he surfed the internet, slept a little bit, did some reading. It was not until 11.01 a.m. on Thursday morning that he gave up and decided they probably weren't going to answer his call promptly. By that time, he had been on hold, listen to this, for 15 hours, 40 minutes, and one second. And it was that one second that really cheesed him. But uh, 15 hours, 40 minutes, I mean, that has to be some kind of, of world record. All of us, I think, know the frustration of waiting. When you listen to David's pleading question, repeated four times, how long? 
Lord, how long are you going to hide your face from me? We, we just feel it, 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 that sense that God has forgotten him. God's forgotten him. That, that sense that somehow a God who is supposed to be compassionate and, and loving is either too busy or, or too distant or he's just essentially placed David on hold. Four times, David cries out, Oh, Lord, how long? Look at verse one. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And of course, and we all know this, uh, the great temptation in those long hours of waiting is to more or less just kind of hang up on God, right? We just, we just kind of quietly put down the phone aside. There's not, there's, there's not gonna be an answer to my prayer. There's not gonna be uh, any, any support. Uh, I'm pretty much on my own. God simply can't be trusted to finish the story he began back before the origin of the universe. And what we so easily forget is that there's more to the story than we know. Um, anybody, anybody in this room who's a sports fan, you, you know some of the greatest sports stories happen in the final minutes of the game when it looks as if there is absolutely no hope. There's nothing except a humiliating, awful, ugly defeat. And let me just say, Oklahoma fans, I'm sorry if this opens a fresh wound, but, but, but inevitably with each of these situations, each of these stories, when you hear about them, you will also hear about people who, who were so disgusted at the end of the game with a score in the fourth quarter, they just walked out. You, you've heard this, right? They, they leave the game maybe five minutes still left of the fourth quarter, and, 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 uh, and, and they figure they're going to beat the traffic at least, and, and they kind of feel a little bit smug because they're not like those suckers who are still in there, you know, hopefully waiting for something to turn around that is not going to turn around. But they find out the next day. They find out the next day they missed an amazing comeback. You know, the, the Hail Mary pass, the, the interception, the, the funnel, the field goal. People are still talking about it, but they left. Because, because in their opinion, from, from their perspective, it was game over. It was game over. The problem, of course, is from their perspective. Your perspective, my perspective is limited. We don't see what God sees. You know, the irony is that so much of the pain in David's life came not because God had hidden his face from David, but because David had hidden his face from God. And, and it certainly isn't always the case, although it often is, that, that like David, it's we. We actually build our own deepest, darkest dungeons of of, of addiction and shame and, and, and guilt and betrayal and law. We don't, we don't see God telling the story we think he ought to be telling, so we begin to write our own stories. We begin to kind of author our own success stories, our own love stories, our own rescue stories. We, we kind of put God on hold and then complain when he doesn't answer us. The cry of your heart this morning, if the cry of your heart this Sunday morning is how long, O oh Lord? If, if you're here and you're kind of looking at the year behind or looking forward to the year to come and, and you just feel trapped on all sides by disappointment and pain or, or fear or hopelessness, the scripture doesn't promise us that waiting is easy. It doesn't tell us to, to manufacture some kind of phony happiness while we're on hold listening to awful music. What God does call us to do is to wait, is to wait, wait faithfully. It's a great story from start to finish, but the story isn't finished yet. It may get worse before it gets better, but it's going to get a whole lot better. It may not look like that from our perspective this morning, but we have a limited perspective. We don't see what God sees. Don't leave the story too soon. Prophet Isaiah puts it this way, Isaiah chapter 40. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's where we begin. 
That's where we begin. Psalm 13 reminds us first to wait, wait faithfully. Secondly, secondly, uh, the key to endurance in this new year is to watch hopefully, to watch hopefully. I don't know if you've ever seen these, uh, these things before, but, but at least once every year or so, uh, the website BuzzFeed will actually run a series of pictures or stories about people who have seen the face of Jesus in their food. Uh, have you seen this? So, so you'll get like Jesus in, the, in, the, in a banana peel, you know, or, or you get uh, Jesus in the Cheeto, uh, or, or uh, yeah, Jesus in the fish stick. Uh, in, in fact, I, I can't even find the fish stick there. Uh, and then there's Jesus in the potato chip. And, and, and in my favorite, and this is kind of uh, crazy, Jesus in the Chick-fil-A sandwich. Holy cow, look at that. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? But I'm going to be honest, I don't generally... Uh, <laughs> take too much stock of this stuff. Frankly, I typically consume my food too quickly to carefully examine it for portraits of biblical characters. But I am inspired by people who are looking for the face of God in unexpected places, those God sightings where we do not expect to sight him. Because it points us to a basic truth about faith. Those of us who endure in times of difficulty are able to see that God might be working where and when we least expect him to. That, that's the discipline of hopeful watching, hopeful watching. If you look at Psalm 13, verses three and four, David basically cries out to God with three requests. Number one, consider me, consider me. Literally, don't, don't forget me, Lord. Number two, answer me. Literally, please, Lord, don't leave me in silence. But then there's this third request, Awaken me, awaken me, light up my eyes, literally open my eyes, which probably at some level is David just pleading with God to help him stay alive. Like don't, don't allow his eyes to be closed in, in death. But if you take a look at all three requests together, it's pretty clear David knows that he faces a, a danger even beyond the danger of physical death. And that, and that is being numb to the life and the presence and the work of, of God. You see, David's praying in essence in verse three, Lord, awaken me to what you're doing in my life. Help, help me to see beyond what I see. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews makes a, a stunning statement. He explains uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The conviction of things not seen. That's the key to hopeful watching. You know, one of the comments that Pastor Dan made last week that really struck with me was when he cited that great promise from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Do you not perceive it? It's as if God is saying, look, I'm, I'm doing this now. This is not something to come. This is something that has already begun. Do you not see it? Open your eyes, it's there. Let that fact shape your perceptions. Let that be the lens through which you look at your life. In fact, you, you may remember this, Pastor Dan. Uh, if you were here last week, he was telling us about that. Remember that bumpy uh, six-hour you know, bus ride uh, to Pekara up in the middle hills of Nepal, and he described it as occasionally terrifying and con constantly uncomfortable. And I remember that quote because I immediately thought of middle school. Uh, just occasionally terrifying and constantly on. But it also sounds a lot like the first four verses of Psalm 13. I mean, over and over, the question David is asking is how long? And that is precisely the question Pastor Dan said kept haunting him. How long? How long before we finish this part of the trip? And he reminded us it had been very, very easy. Very, very tempting on that uncomfortable seat on that day, on that rocky, rutted road, just to get distracted by the pain and basically just close his mind and his eyes to what there was to see. In fact, do you remember he, he told us, yes, there was pain. There, there was very real pain. No, no question about it. But there was, even in that pain, if I was willing to open my eyes in the snow-covered peaks of Nepal surrounding me, evidence all around 
the, the goodness and grandeur of God is, is real. See, hopeful watching is when we look beyond what we can see and feel. I wonder if there's some of us here this morning who are looking back to a bumpy road in the past year, looking ahead to a hard road in the coming year, financial hassles, health problems, concerned with a loved one or a family member, and, and, and it's distracting you from the God who is, even in the pain, very near. See, faithful waiting begins with the open eyes of hopeful watching. It's praying, God, God, let me see your work. Right here, right now, in this situation, this hard place, this scary experience, imagine how that might change your perspective, your, your approach to life, your uh, conversations, your relationships, your, your approach to work. If you were to open your eyes this new year every single day by faith and be awakened to the hope and the prayer that God is at work in the landscape of your life. That could make an amazing difference. Paul writes in Ephesians 3.14, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, Christ will shine on you. Not might shine on you, will shine on you. So first, faithful, faithful waiting. Second, hopeful watching. And then finally, whether or not we like what it is that we see, we submit to God in humble wonder. Um, I, I spoke twice this fall at uh, a camp called Ponderosa Lodge out in Santa Cruz, California, once for a middle school weekend, once for a high school weekend. And, and, and one of the cool parts about speaking at Ponderosa Lodge is that they have a, they have a skit that kind of goes through the whole weekend, reinforcing the theme of the weekend. And they do very elaborate uh, stage sets for these uh, dramas. Uh, I usually speak after the drama in a, a normal session, so I'm always, always backstage when these dramas happen. So essentially, my total experience of the story is through a little tiny hole cut uh, in the back of the set for me to peep through. And, and, and I can hear laughter, and I can hear kids responding, and I can hear dialogue, and, and I can even hear people moving around the stage, and every now and then somebody backside will pass my little peephole, but my whole perspective on the story is essentially about the size of a walnut. So I don't try to direct the drama. I don't try to rewrite the drama. I don't try to critique the drama. I just try to make sure that when it's my turn to be on the stage, I am faithful to the drama. That's the act of humble surrender that we see, that sense of, of humble wonder that we see reflected in these final verses of Psalm 13. David prays verse five, but... I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Look back at the text. He says, I have trusted. My soul shall rejoice. I will sing. What you see in these words is a complete 180. First the complaint, now the rejoicing. And the only way you can really explain it, this complete mind change, is that David is looking in a faith of humble wonder. His situation hasn't changed. I mean, if you look at the text, he's still waiting on God. It's still facing threats from demons on the outside and demons on the inside. But there's something about that little word, but David is a different man. The big story has changed. The big change has happened, not, not because uh, somehow David's story has changed, but because David has embraced a new way of thinking about his story. And he's embraced a new faith in the storyteller. It's not unlike, actually, what you see in Luke chapter 2, when a young mother surrounded by uh, the squalor uh, of a stable uh, is visited by shepherds, and they give her this crazy story about how they were out watching their flocks, and then all of a sudden there were a host of angels, uh, and there was this unearthly brightness in the middle of the sky, and they began to talk about the good news of a Savior who's going to be born in great joy, and somehow her little baby boy was going to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. She couldn't have possibly seen the whole drama that night, looking at eternity through a little tiny peephole of time. But the scripture says Mary trusted the storyteller. And we read in chapter 2, verse 19 of the Gospel of Luke, that Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. 
It's a picture of humble wonder. I don't know what kind of little peephole you're looking through this morning. I don't know if it's a little tiny pinprick of pain. I don't know if it's a gash of an open wound. Maybe it's a huge window of joy and contentment. But here's what I do know. Here's what the scripture promises us for this new year. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. No eye has seen, nor has ear heard, nor has the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. The good news of the gospel this morning is that God so loved the world that he came to earth as a human being. That means we are not forgotten. And that he came in the person of Jesus, fully human and fully God, which means he knows us. He knows us better than we know even ourselves. He knows our our weaknesses. He knows our temptations. He knows our longings. And because of that bountiful love that David talks about in Psalm 13, Jesus died on the cross on our behalf and rose again from the dead so we could be awakened from that living death coma the scripture calls sin. And if we believe in him, scripture tells us, We won't perish. We'll have everlasting life. Now, I get it. That might be hard for us to get our heads around that truth this morning. But remember this. You know, the hopes and dreams of David locked up in Psalm 13 in a prison of worry and despair, they were put on hold for a thousand years. A thousand years. And it would have been very, very easy to just declare it's, it's done. Game over. All the prophecies and predictions of a win. That was just hype. And all you have to do is read through the Old Testament and and you're going to see there are plenty of fumbles and and, and lost yardage and out of bounds and drops and penalties that that made it pretty plain that, look, uh, this is a lost cause despite what God says. But just when the stadium had gone dark, just when everybody pretty darn near uh, walked out of the park, that's when the lights came up. That's when the angels appeared. And as Paul put it in Galatians chapter 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son so that we might receive adoption as his children. So we could know once and for all we are valued, we are loved, we are heard, and we absolutely are not forgotten. And the story of that birth, which literally begins with a Hail Mary, is told in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1, with these words, listen to this. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. If you're here this morning and you are asking these questions, hard questions, important questions, difficult questions, God, where are you? This passage reminds us today, he is here, right in our midst. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of knowing in the midst of the waiting, hard waiting, tough questions, scary times, frustrations, big and small, that you are at work. Give us hearts that watch for that work. Give us, Lord, a humility that wonders even when we don't see, that takes a look at the God sightings around us. And everybody said together, amen.